Hey guys, welcome to The Writer's Journey. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the awesome Kayleen Williams and the inimitable Ellen Campbell. Inimitable. Inimitable, <laughs> yes. Cannot be imitated by anyone. Today we're doing something a little different. We are going to do some live editing for you all, so you'll just get to kind of see the process, and if you're in the chat, you'll get to ask us questions, and I hope you enjoy it. So, Ellen, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be good. And even better, there's talk of Ask the Editor coming back. What? Well, if this goes well, and you guys, I can't thank you enough. When I asked for it, you came through for me. 15 submissions. There is probably not any chance that I can get to all of them today. So we're going to make it up to you by bringing back Ask the Editor and just doing your submissions, one submission at a time. So keep them coming. Yes. Good, sense? good. So hopefully everyone loves this and we can keep doing it. Yeah, it'll be a chance for you to see raw, unedited writing from actual authors. Um, some of them, it's very, very raw, very pure. And then you'll see what happens as an editor takes a look at the manuscript as she goes through it and the little tweaks and changes she can make to just make the meaning a little bit more clear, make the word choice more concise, make the characters, their voices kind of come out. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about process today and um, Ellen, um, how are you doing? I'm good. Do you want to get started? Yeah. Let's do yes. It. Roll the dice. Okay. <laughs> what do we got up? Right, so Jeff. basically how this is going to go, Lauren's going to roll a uh, internet dice. We have 15 and I don't have a 15 sided dice. Um, and then whoever pops up, I'm going to read it. And as I'm reading it, Ellen's going to be doing some edits live. And then we're going to discuss them and probably do more edits after the read. So here we go. We rolled the dice and we got sample number 11. Number 11. Opening that bad boy. Who's it gonna be? I don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. She made it all anonymous. I did. All right. So it's all anonymous. I have no idea whose this is. So if you know your words, then you'll know you're up. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's save that. All right. <clears throat> I swallowed. One minute till drop. I watched as a timer popped onto my screen, then counted down. The ship dove and my stomach lurched with it. Shielding expanded around us as it opened fire, when it stopped hovering slightly above the ground. Well, at least what looked like ground, we could disembark. The others didn't hesitate. I unhooked and jumped, the solid ground squelched beneath my feet. Targeting and fire anything you see coming out of the rift. We're due to we're due a changeover. The order came through, and I had no idea who it was even from. Dame? I looked up and it was clear there was another dropship incoming, though a fair distance away. I moved into position and waited till I could see something to target. I saw the longest, thickest thing trying its best to emerge. I shivered. Tentacles. Hmm. I hated them. With but a thought, I opened missile fire. It was monstrous. Easy three times the height of us. And as wide as half the opening, I could see. What the hell was it? Laser fire ripped through the creature's tentacles, slicing deep and blood spurted forwards. It didn't stop, though. Then there were missiles incoming. The shields from the drop ships as they crossed over managed to take the brunt of the enemy fire, but one got through. I saw it strike the mega in the arm, ripping it right off. Fuck. Those men, women, were they dead? I didn't have time to think that mega took another one and was going down. Without thinking, I ran for the gap, inserting myself in the path. The injured mega had disengaged. Alice, get your team on that dropship, a familiar voice said. said. It was Dame. Now I recognized it. Covering, I called. Dame, we got them. Kyle, she asked. Reporting for duty, ma'am. Then hold that line. Will do. Her attention moved back to ordering the others around, making sure her teams and the swap were all going to go... Wait. Were all going to go to plan. Most didn't seem to know what to do or where to go. Edward and his mega were just standing there. I couldn't do anything else but our mega team wasn't being watched proper 
properly. Stupid fucker, I said. I'm going to pause right here because this one's actually 695 words, and I want to see where I'm at. <laughs> see what this does. Ellen, man, she's already going to town. Look at that. <laughs> Got blue lines everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to stop um, after the paragraph while I listen to. And in the meanwhile, Ellen, could you make the screen bigger if it's possible? Could I make it bigger? I can, um, like, um, zoom I'm in. On Whoa! I'm on, I'm on maximum right now. Oh, okay. Uh, I can make the type bigger. Yeah, if you could. Yeah, yeah there we go. There, yeah, that's good. Right. Maybe a couple more. Can you do a couple more bumps up? Try to make it bigger for you all to see. There. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Yeah. That's as big as it's going to get and still be on the screen. That's yes. good. We that's can perfect. See all right. So, all right. got. Did you have some comments you wanted to say? Did I? No, huh? No. Sorry. <laughs> as we do this, this is so fun. I'm having fun. I hope y'all watching are having fun as well. All right, Hiroto, can you direct the others? Totally, but it can't come from me. It has to come from your mouth. They can see where they need to be from the dropship. You send them, let me know. While I listened to Hiroto and fired on the rift, the second dropship landed and the merged mechs around us moved out. I relayed orders to the other four megas in my group, hoping that Edward would take over at any moment. He didn't. At least he'd moved and was at least firing from the easiest position he could. The missile fire from him along with the others was making a dent, at least. The tentacle before us was blasted time and again. We were almost through cutting it in half, but the incoming fire to us had also ramped up. The other mega merge team, while... Wait, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. While they swapped over, had really weakened this position. Yeah, that sentence can be fixed. <laughs> The other mega merge team. Yeah. Anyway. So what are your thoughts so far, Lauren, as you were watching Ellen's edits? So far, I really like the scene. I like that the author seems to be, be like they're, they're putting the characters in the scene and they're putting the reader in the scene by using a whole lot of sensory details. Not only are they showing me the action and showing me the scene as it unfolds, but they're using sound words like squelched when he jumps down. Um, I'm hearing the gunfire. I'm seeing the explosions. Uh, he talks about, b before we see the tentacles, he talks about you know something coming up out of the water and he kind of describes it a little bit. And then we, which gives the reader an opportunity to kind of guess what's coming. And then we see it. It's a tentacle monster. So kind of all of that's like building tension. Um, and uh, what were you thinking, Kayleen, as you were reading it? So, yeah, and to make clear, this is the first time I've ever seen any of these words. So this is all a complete mm. dry read. So yeah. this is sort of the type of thing I do when I'm preparing to do a narration, is I'll do a dry read just to see kind of like how cohesive it, it comes out verbally um for the most part it was fairly clear you know i didn't bobble up too many times um i like how especially for this genre you, you know you're not spending too much time in you know like fancy prose you got to get in get out and get moving um and the words that are being used it was monstrous boom there done in and out um easily three times the height of us and as wide as half of the opening I could see. So it's like, it's, it's quick with enough description that it's painting that broader picture. So I do, I do like right. those bits. Yeah. One of the things that I like about this story too, is he seems to have a balance or she uh, seems to have a balance between telling us what's happening in the story and showing us through visual descriptions. Uh, Rick wants to push so, back on your statement about monstrous, though. Did you see that in the comments? Where? Says, let me see. I don't like I don't, monstrous. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Should demonstrate that instead of state that. So what does he mean and by that? This demonstrate is, that instead of state it. So, you know, and Rick, uh, that was by Rick Partlow. He's not entirely wrong. Um, I I say that I like it for the sense of, whoa. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> Um, is this yours, Partlow? I 
Oh, no, he was not. he was making a comment when I said um, it was monstrous, and I said I like that um, just because it's quick, it's in and out, you know. But he's not wrong when he says it should be demonstrated. Um, you know, there's there's so many different ways to kind of handle this particular part of the story. Um, so yeah, it's it's neither right nor wrong. Rick says he wants to clarify what he means by describe the thing so it's obvious it's monstrous. Instead of telling us it's monstrous, show us in your description something that's so monstrous that the reader, sorry, the reader goes, oh, that's a real monster, um, rather than coming out and s saying that. And with that, um, on the fly kind of a thought, I saw the longest, thickest thing trying its best to emerge. I shivered tentacles. I hated them. Yes. So that is a little bit in the way where that description is. So it is kind of getting reiterated. It was monstrous. Okay, we know it's monstrous. It's the biggest, thickest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <clears throat> so Ellen, When Ellen's able to pull her screen back up, she was in the middle of making a comment on one of the things. Did I not pull it back up? Nope, yes, it's gone. It's just our faces. <laughs> Try that again. <laughs> What else is going on? And this is true. Where did it go over here? Ellen is the master editor. She is. She truly is. All right. So in here, let's see. She had highlighted with but a thought. And her comment to that is what? The phrase is actually without a thought. If there was a thought involved, you should elaborate on the thought. Purple prose is all well and good. No, it's not. But you need to be careful. Um, so like here in this part with but a thought i opened missile fire um so I, I, i'm assuming this is in context to they think the thing and then their machine does the thing they think um uh the way i took that was with okay is that what that means okay because that's what i that's what so in in there, there that's needs, not what i got out of it yeah there but, needs but, to be but, a but, slight, but we also have to remember that there's a whole lot of context that came before this particular section i mean this is mm -hmm. the beginning of the story we dropped in in the middle so some of these complaints or some of these statements i'm making over here these little comments may be completely invalid mm. so but uh yeah so ellen what was actually your impression? Makes sense. so we're gonna we're gonna delete that comment because it was a little snotty but it's, it's still a little purple what do you mean by purple? I mean, I, I mean, I wanted to point it out because I mean, it really was a good comment to make. Is um, you you don't want to be too vague, um, especially if this is the first time that you're describing how the characters are interacting with their machines to make them do the things. Um, like with but a thought doesn't tell us much, you know. But like Ellen was saying, we're being dropped in in the middle. So right. if this has been established, then. Well, I think Lauren nailed it. I think that he's got thought controlled weapons. Yeah. But the with but a thought is is I call that purple prose because it's like it's an attempt to be poetic almost. Not not really poetic, but profound maybe. And it's it doesn't really work. It's not really needed for the story kind of thing. Oh, and I like this uh I like this other one. Easy easily three times the height of us so she highlighted times the height of us and that comment is what is us a human a ship so you're you're losing the context of what you're um comparing it to because yeah, there there's is a lot no going that. yeah there's there's no comparative it's just us um so is it the ships that they're in is it the actual humans is it the land that they're around um and then again, as wide as half the opening. And then that one goes to, maybe you can see it, but we can't. What is this open? So what, yeah, where is this opening? What does it look like? Where is it coming from? All right, so oh. Ellen, what did you think when you were reading this, this sample? And I think it's pretty good. It? Yeah. It's well written, it's missing some punctuation, but I mean, that's easy enough. Uh, it makes sense. It's internally coherent, externally coherent. It's, it's coherent, period. Um, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's, it's a good, solid piece of writing. I mean, for that hasn't been edited, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. 
which maybe and right at the beginning um so after one minute till drop i watched as a timer popped onto my screen she immediately changed that to a timer popped onto my screen we don't care what they're watching we know they're watching it because they're there so it, it's that you filter that it. she's always talking about yeah it's a filter. Yeah, I mean, you're divorcing your, your reader from, the, you're divorcing your character from the reader, and that's just not what you want to do. You want your character to care. You want it to be immediate for them, that you want them right in the moment. And if you say, oh, such and so happened because I saw it, you've just pushed them one step back. Right. And you don't want to do that. That's and what also, you mean by filtering. Filter. That's what filtering is. You, you put a filter between your reader and your character. And the easiest fix is just to delete, just delete I saw, filter. I looked, I heard, and just have the rest of the sentence there. And then usually it makes sense. You might need to tweak the words a little bit, but that works almost every time. And the thing about using looked and saw and watched and heard and felt and thought, all of that, is that uh, it gets really repetitive really fast. Did you see how many times I deleted look or see or watch in a page in less than a page three times four times which yeah, which doesn't seem crazy. like a lot but when you're reading through it it's a lot it does get heavy all right so um how much time do we want to spend per sample so, i feel like wanna... we've gone pretty good on this one yes and this is other... well done you've done a, you've done a really good job for the most part um, I'm pickier than most people. I see things other people don't see. That's why I'm an editor. Or that's what makes me an editor. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I don't hate this. And that's that's a big compliment. Yeah. Ready to I will say it next? was it was fairly easy on a dry read. So I'm going to give you a clapper. Clapper of writing. All right. Let's move on. Roll the dice. I want to try and get through as many as we can because this is fun. Okay. I'm happy. All right, Dice says sample number 12. Number 12. Number 12. Double clicky click. Open up the document. And... Oh. Well, somebody knows who they are. <laughs> All righty. So here we go. Sample number 12. You said you commanded trireme. I need to know how to pronounce that. Alario commented to the ship's officer. I do, Gallo replied. He rotated his head, opened his eyes, and swallowed hard. Sir, I failed to notice your rank. The centurion pushed off the ground and saluted it first, Alario said. The first what, senior tribune? Gallo inquired. The first salute I've received all day, Alario told him. I have an assignment for you, and Valeria's image. Unless it has to do with idling on the beach, Gallo reported. There's not much I or my ship can do for you, sir. But you are here at the distribution department. Or rather, you are sitting outside the department, Valerio observed. Surely they have outfitted your vessel. No, sir. To quote Tribune Ninevita, the last boat we will equip is a messenger Turim, Gallo stated. I come here every day, hoping for supplies. Once I have those... I'll need oars, oarsmen, sailors, and legionnaires, and my principal, principales back. Where did your ship officers go? Illyrio asked. My personnel office drafted them as instructors for oarsmen training, Gallo responded. Come with me, Illyrio directed. Okay, can I just take a pause? Hmm. Okay, mysterious author that we don't know who you are. <laughs> reported, observed, responded, asked, directed, inquired. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just going to say that because it's, it gets it for, and this is probably a personal thing for me. Um, you don't need that many unique tags. Dialogue tags. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can have, you know, a couple, a couple of them if it's really going to, um, make what the dialogue is saying or doing stronger, but yeah. in the action of the scene, it's already should be strong on its own. That said or asked is strong enough. Um, yeah, there's a debate about dialogue tags about it's a huge one. So you, most whether you want to, you know, just stick with said so that like they're not 
they don't draw attention to themselves, or if you want to use different words so you're not repeating the same words over and over again. But um, really with dialogue tags, they just need to make clarification for who's speaking. And once we have it ascertained that there's two people talking to each other, we know who they are, you really don't need the dialogue tag anymore unless you know every once in a while you want to add one of them in just to remind the reader who's speaking you could probably delete a lot of the dialogue tags and not have them at all um, that said if you do need them said is probably you know the easiest you know for for readers and then every once in a while having something different like retorted gallo retorted that has much more emotion Mm -hmm. than said would have there so maybe As, that would be a case especially asked... with yeah especially with that particular dialogue unless it has to do with idling on the beach gallo retorted it it adds to the inflection of what he's saying rather right. than just gallo said because yeah. then it, it becomes unless it has to do with idling on the beach gallo said yeah, unless so... it has to do with idling on the beach gallo retorted because <laughs> as you're reading it mm -hmm. you can you can see those words ahead so instinctually in the back of your mind you're giving it a different inflection seeing retorted rather than said but if so. it said gallo gallo retorted then you don't need a laro in the line above or mm -hmm. after because it's understood that the next one's a laro so you d could just delete that tag altogether and you wouldn't need to have it yep. all right so let's see where did i stop before <laughs> i went on my my tag rant uh he led the ship's officer into the building through the crowd of centurions and the interior doorway. In the large back room, he marched to the area, area with the oars, benches, and planks. This is Centurion Gallo, Alario told the clerk. He is on an assignment for me. I need him off the beach and on his way by the day after tomorrow. Is that a problem? After that station, Alario escorted Gallo to the other areas and repeated the speech. Finally, he guided the ship's officer into the supply centurion's office. Gallo is on a mission for me, Alario stated. I need him launched, but he needs supplies before that happens. Am I clear? Tribune Ninevita has forbidden us supply tree reams until the real warships are outfitted, the supply officer informed Alario. Then the centurion got a smug expression on his face and added, You can't expect me to go against orders. One, Alario roared. He extended his arm and shoved a finger at the supply officer's face. I am a senior tribune, and you will respect the rank. Two, I have given you an order. My order supersedes anything your tribune said before he left. Now I want, no, make that pro proconsul Regulus needs the Filria's image launched and on her way in two days. Yes, sir, the centurion acknowledged. Alario and Gallo marched out of the office. Sir, all the supplies in the world won't help me get off the beach, the ship officers reminded Alario. I need oarsmen and my officers. All right, so any notes from what Ellen's been tinkering? Um, not yet. Um, one thought I had, the writing does sound... Um, it sounds professional, like I can get the sense of the professionalism of the officers here. Uh, but they do sound very similar. Alario and Gallo sound like similar characters. And part of that is because they're both officers, so they're going to be using a lot of the officer jargon, a lot of their syntax, and their sentence structure is going to be similar because just that is the way, you know, people talk. But it's a lot easier for the reader to follow. And it, it can be more fun if characters have really distinct personalities and that comes across in the way they speak, in the way they talk. Um, and again, that would help with being able to cut back on the dialogue tags if the reader just has such a strong sense of what each character sounds like and is like that they don't really need the, gal the dialogue tags to kind of follow. Um, so one, one suggestion I might make uh, to the author is to have maybe an actor or a friend or some person in mind that you kind of connect with that character that you can ask yourself what would they say in this situation how would they respond how would they act and and try to pick someone who's really different from other people in your 
in your cast of characters that they kind of really stand out and pop. What what were you thinking, Kayleen? So ov- overall, um, and I would need to read it probably a second time just to be sure, but a lot of this is kind of starting to feel repetitive as far as what we're hearing, what the conversation is being going on. Um, like even just in this part where he's leading the officer to the building and he's going through all these different clerks, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six. It's like 20 lines of the same thing over and over again in different ways. Um, so maybe definitely some tightening in there um, would be my, my my first my first impression um, without rereading it to really figure out what the hangup is um, between these two characters. Um, and this this is I saw it up here a little bit. It's Roman historical fiction. Um, yes. So the the genre of it definitely does matter. Um, but this part, I don't know, it's I'm missing some spice, if that makes sense. So kind of in the way, oh my goodness, my bird's gone. Um, and where you're saying the two characters sound the same, um, maybe some, some of the action beats, because we don't really get one until he gets mad and is extending his arm and shoving a finger at the supply officer's face. That's like really the first, well, you know. There was three in the first. Was there? Yeah. Did I miss it? Yeah. Rotated his head, opened his eyes and swallowed hard. Hmm. Um, no, oh. um, my, you guys are right. There, there's kind of a sameness to it and a lot, and it's contributed to by the non-standard dialogue tags because you're kind of expecting the next non-standard tag and I personally am a fan of non-standard tags. I like them. I don't think that the people that say, oh, never, 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 I think they can just go stick it in their ear. I never say never, just. No, I didn't mean you. <laughs> I just want to be clear, so just in case anyone thought I said never use them. I, just, yeah, I, didn't, I, mean, I didn't mean Kayleen. If I said yeah, I consider them like a hot is. spice. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, there's a sameness and that's contributed to also by the fact that there's no contractions going on. And I get that you're doing kind of historical historical fiction here and that's great except for you've got you've got to interpret it for the people today and it sounds kind of stiff and formal without contraction so you need to throw a few of those in there which is my opinion but yeah so well, you're the centurion character or or maybe the head officer the guy with the highest rank he might have more stiff and formal way of speaking. And then yeah. the other guy that he's talking to might have more contractions. And then just that contrast would kind of add more flavor to the dialogue. Okay. All right. I, I, I really have nothing else to say <laughs> without, else, without rereading. Was there anything um, else that you noticed as you were editing it that kind of sticks out to you as, um, as, a, as lessons we could draw from this? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lauren, you had it right. You can drop a lot of the, the dialogue tags in a conversation like this because this is mostly dialogue. You just need the occasional tag to anchor who is who for the reader. You don't have to, don't, using their names over and over again is repetitive as well. This is Gallo, Alario told the clerk. Alario escorted Gallo. Gallo was on a mission, Alario stated. You know, the, the repetition becomes kind of, kind of, and I'm sorry, but it becomes kind of tedious for the reader too. It kind of just, it just becomes kind of the whole thing turns into kind of a drone. Does that make sense? Yeah, because all you're really hearing is, it's just like with the, the watch, the looks, um, you end up only hearing uh, Gallo, Alario, Gallo, Alario, Gallo, Alario. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sorry, I won't do that to you guys anymore. All so right. right now you can only see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So thank you for that submission, and we hope that you gain juicy bits out of it. Hmm. Who's up and next? You guys, if any of you have questions about any of this, feel free to ask me if I did something terrible to your manuscript or I was wrong. I mean, I'm happy to tell you why I did what I did and what I, what else I would do about it. So don't, yeah. don't, don't think you can't ask me because you can. 
Yeah, pop questions in the chat right now if you have any. We'll keep an eye on that. And also you can uh, come to Keystroke Medium's Facebook group and chat with any of us there, ask questions there. Um, so our next up is sample number one. Ooh, clickety click click, open, open. All righty, here we go. All right. <clears throat> Jack held up severed, held up a severed ear and made sure the merchant gripped in his other hand saw the spindly tattoo on its withered lobe. The people that bear this mark, where are they? The triple chinned merchant clawed at the hand holding him up on his tiptoes. What was, what was that? They'll kill me. They might do it later, but I'll kill you right now. Jack snarled. By Anthique, the Northgate ruins, they're there. Jack shoved the man back and drew his sword. He put the chisel-tipped end against the man's ear. If you've lied. The merchant shook, his eyes wide with panic. No, I swear upon Ada, may she bring me bad luck. Jack replaced the narrow blade on his back. He stepped back and spread his hands. See? Was that so hard? Really? You could have saved yourself a lot of sweat. The man spat. You lich marked jackal humping little coofer. I should die! The merchant gasped. He stumbled back as Jack's sword took off his left ear and was back in its sheath before the man could even see it drawn. That's for the back talk, Jack said as he plucked the jeweled bit of meat from the air, turned, and left. So this is in two parts. Um, so Ellen has immediately highlighted all the backs. There are a lot of backs. Um, and generally through this part, because I don't know, I'm pretty sure this is in the center of the scene. Um, but this first sentence, Jack held up a severed ear and made sure the merchant gripped in his other hand, saw the spindly... T okay, so reading it a second time, now I understand what it's saying. Um, this is a really long sentence for me. It feels kind of... Uh, do you understand what I'm saying, Lauren? The yeah, well, you read together. it out. Yeah, you read it out loud, and it starts to get awkward. And it might have made sense to you in the moment when you're writing it down. It's in your head. It's clear, right? But the, but the reader is not in your head yet. They're trying to figure out what you're trying to say. Um, so the act of reading it out loud might make you kind of trip over it, and that is a little flag for you that that sentence needs to be rewritten. Maybe broken up into two smaller sentences and rewritten so it's smooth and clear and the reader gets it immediately in the first time. Yeah, so initially Jack held up a severed ear. He made sure the merchant gripped in his other hand, with commas, saw the spindly tattoo. Oh, oh the spindly tattoos on the ear. Okay. <laughs> I thought he was talking about his arm. Um, okay, so Jack held up the sever severed ear, period. He made sure the merchant saw the spindly tattoo on the lobe, on the withered lobe, or something like that. Because, um, I don't know, just like gripped in his other hand. I don't know. I don't know. Is there, there's a lot of directions going on just in that one sentence, so... Other but that's thoughts. exactly the thing that the reader needs to be able, be able to follow and pick up on so they understand what's going on in the scene. Um, so if we're trying to pack too many details into one sentence, then the reader might get those muddled up. And um, you as the author, you again, it might be perfectly clear to you, but the reader's not in your head. Um, the, the other thing that we can tend to do as writers is we're just trying to get the words out. We're in the zone, right? Um, and when we were doing that, we can tend to use the same words over and over again. We're just reaching right into our word hoard and we're picking out the same word. That's where we end up using the same word five or six times in a couple paragraphs. That's right there because we're just in that zone. Um, so if that's how you write, you know, you're in the flow, then keep doing it. It's working for you. You're getting yep. the words at, out, Spill them. <laughs> but you will need to go back later and look for that. Am I reusing the same words? Am I repeating the same ideas? Um, what do I need to just delete? And which words do I need to replace with something else so I'm not repeating the same word? All right. So, so if, you know that if you know that you have that tendency, it's not bad. It's fine. It's just how you get your words out. But you'll need to go back in editing later to, to um, focus on that and fix it. 
Yeah, so I, that's what I call it the uh, the vomit stage. Just just ugh, all the words. I don't care if they're repeated um, too much. I'm just getting the scene out and all the bits, and then that's when I go back and I'm just like, huh, okay. Well, I'm just gonna need to tidy this little bit up a little bit tiny here. Yeah, you can't right. edit a blank page, so if that's how you get the words out, more power to you. All right, so Ellen has has moved on to the to the second part, so I'll read a little bit into here. Sorry. No, you're good. No, keep going. Do your thing. The jeweled earrings brought a handful of clipped silver king's heads, enough to rent rooms and eat well for a time. Jack sat on the lip of a public fountain and took stock. He was stuck here for a time. His horse lay dead a week back along his path through the sea of stones. He had been a good horse, too. He reached with a sandaled foot to scritch his new companion behind the ears. The young hyena had been following him since he passed by a group of them, scavenging at the city's garbage dump. And this happened sometimes, and he'd long since stopped questioning it. The young male sneezed, then took his foot in its mouth, softly gnawing the growling like a cub. Oh, and growling like a cub. You look weird, he heard a voice say in betrating a toys and he half turned to find a dozen young children watching him from the other side of the fountain, as dusty and ragged as he was. A girl with a hair clasp shaped like a butterfly was the one who spoke. He smiled. He supposed he did. He was Kufur, outsider. He was of modest height and bronze where their people were tall and dark. His eyes, a kindled golden heat, where theirs were soft shades of umber and shadow. His long hair fell in silky bangs across his eyes, where theirs were coarse, tight, and close. Thoughts? Or what Ellen's in there doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is good. This is really good. Yeah, we didn't say that right off the bat, but um, even from the beginning, I was like, there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of action right from the start. He's got, he definitely has a sense of humor, the author does in his descriptions and in what the characters say and do. Really, it would just, the writing just needs some polishing, but then once it's done, I can tell right away this will be a fun book to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I will say I agree. I like um, the promise of, of where that initial um, dialogue is, is going because it's like you get just, yeah, like you're saying, just a little bit of polishing and then this kind of funny, but like, oh crap moment with this guy and the sword to his ear and it's getting lopped up and you know the the quick banter of the dialogue itself you know by and think the northgate ruins they're there like you can you can kind of feel um the character's anguish in it so i like it this uh the imagery is great it's, it's really very good and so you are to be commended for your imagery not so much for your abuse of the word back which is one of the words on my list, as a matter of fact. Okay, um, yeah, I don't hate this. Yay! That's about as, that's about as good as it gets. <laughs> Sorry. Now, hey, these are quick and dirty edits, man. We're just going yes. in, flying and cuff. They're perfect either. This is just, yeah, quick and dirty. Sorry, I won't step on you anymore, Kayleen. No, you're good. <laughs> you're he good. also doesn't have like giant paragraphs describing his world. But just from the way he talks, he has the dialogue and he, he describes the characters, I can tell that there's different races. We've got interesting um, creatures that that are thoughtful, like this hyena. He might he might be like one a pet in World of Warcraft who might kind of follow you and help you hunt. I'm not sure, but he just seems like a smart a smart creature. Um, the characters have different. There's different races. There's different clothes. There's culture. So the world's kind of unfolding, and I'm curious to see where he's going to go with it without info dumps, which is kind of cool. Yay! Thank you for submitting your words. <laughs> this was my very first submission, so I'm glad oh. that we got So the first brave one. Ooh, yes. there we yes. go. You can tell he's brave by his writing. Okay, roll the dice. Twelve, uh, wait. We and we're 12. rolling, rolling, rolling. 14. Number 14. All right, 14, you're on deck. And waiting for my computer to do the loading. Loady, loady. Okay. Rodney Pook Shelton 
and looked up at a dark, starless sky and knew things had gone sideways. His pops had always said it, said it like that when shit just didn't go right. And this shit ain't right, Rodney thought. This is all the way sideways. Sideways, wrong, everything was wrong. But he figured that out bit by bit as his mind gave up the details. So greedy with the details. For one thing, he saw the sky with only his left eye. His right eye felt puffy and refused to open. For another, the patch of sky that he could see lacked the ever-present yellow glow of a Chicago night, replaced instead by an orange heat that danced through the edges of his sight. Flickering and pulsing, not sitting still like proper city lights, his nose told him a firebird nearby, or fires. It was hard to be sure, hard to focus. The only thing he was aware of, bone-deep positive of, was that neither the odd glow nor the smell had convinced him that things were holy and horribly sideways. Rodney knew, knew it because he could see the sky from where he lay on his couch, which sat in his pathetically small living room inside his government-subsidized third-floor apartment in what had been a 16-floor building when he dozed off in front of his Xbox. He blinked his good eye, shaking his head to clear things up mangle things more as his confused mind struggled to make sense of what he saw. The impossible orange-tinged tin sky, jagged and broken edges of, a cin of cinder block walls, an old clock his pops had given him when he moved out, hanging askew above the rent-to-own flat screen. The hands had stopped at 117, though he couldn't be sure if that was days ago or just a couple of minutes. He turned his head slightly on a tattered pillow and grimaced, Teeny bits of gravel, where there should never have been anything like gravel, bit into his right cheek, scraping like sandpaper. Bits of the missing ceiling, a part of his mind whispered. Now, as he came fully conscious, he could feel that he was covered with dust and grit, the only things left of the 13 floors that were supposed to be above him. Missing floors, missing people. Kevin! A stab of fear for his 11-month-old son cleared away the remaining mental haze. It all came back in a rush. Rodney remembered waking around 10 o'clock or so to give Kevin a bottle, rocking him to sleep after laying him back down in the little apartment's only bedroom. Instead of returning to study, to studying for the final paramedic license test, Rodney had turned on the console and fell asleep playing a game he'd beaten 20 times over. There had been a series of low booms, a thrumming that had vibrated up from the floor Though the old blue crazy hide a bed then he didn't remember but kevin so i want to say right off the bat um i in this the opening bit i i like the idea of what you're trying to blend like this it's it's a scattered sense. It's it's thir it's a third person scattered sense of what he's seeing, and experiencing, um, but it doesn't really get going until um, what is that? The second the second largest paragraph. He blinked his good eye. So it yeah. D am I making any sense? <laughs> Do you understand like kind of what I'm saying? It. Um, I feel like some of this can be kind of taken out. Um, so a lot of the his own confusion isn't confusing the reader. Mm -hmm. Yes, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That I'm. I was trying to follow along to figure out what was happening, but I will say I was enjoying it. Like it's it's yeah. The writing no, yeah, is no, beautiful. I... But at first, when he was talking about going sideways, I think of like what's going sideways. So you've. You've started a business, maybe you you've put in a lot of work and the business seems to be going good, but then the customers start dro start dropping off, and now the the business is crumbling. Um, that I would think would be going sideways. You had some kind of plan and it starts falling through. So that that's what I was looking for. Um, but then it kind of sounds like did the building get blown up over top of him? Yeah, so it's yeah, happened? it's not until like the very end you're like, oh, he's been sitting in his room and he's waking up after a giant explosion ripped off half the top of the building. And so, I think maybe you're being overly critical with that because if you were reading this to yourself instead of reading it out loud, it would have gone by faster and it wouldn't have seemed 
like so long before you got there. Sure. And again, you gotta remember context. This this is probably the middle of something, not the first true. of something. Also true. And yes. frankly, I think this is really good. I would I would be willing to do a proofread on this instead of an edit. Oh, well, there you go. But so this is also the opinion of three completely different editors. Yeah, it's true. Um, so like for me, I see something different than what Ellen is seeing. And I'm not saying I don't like it. I do like it. Um, I, I was reading this and I'm just like, I kind of just want to like stop reading out loud so I can just like <laughs> speed read through it a little bit faster. But um, yeah, it's just for me, I just, this opening bit sideways wrong, everything went wrong. Um, his nose told him a firebird nearby. There's just, there's a lot of short to long, which is good. I just think a few less of them might make the that transition from confused what's happening to now we're understanding. That that's that's just me. On the other hand, if this is the beginning, he's world building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that so, as well. Context. A lot of it is context, but no, I, I, I it's very good. It's very good. It's well written. It's not perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get Kayleen's point and I don't disagree with her, but I, I think maybe she's making it. And I think in her opinion, it's, it's more critical than in mine, but from this sample, I, I don't see the problem. If the whole book is written this way, it could be a problem. You get so, yeah. out of the yeah. detail. what Ellen's saying. It also, um, any opinion I make is also, in a, in accordance with you know how's the rest of the of the of this chapter of this story working what led up to this so those are all questions that you know would be answered and thus you know yeah but, but the, with, we're just um, we're editing what's what's in front of us and but yeah, yeah. for we're exactly just, what's in front with nothing yeah. else involved <laughs> and I like it I made one two three four five changes all right okay. sample number fourteen. Yay! Yay golf clap for the least amount oh, of live I, edits. I call my I call my daughter Pook. Oh. Okay. Next right. up I, is sample number seven. Lucky seven. Seven. Double clicky click. So we might have time for one or two more. I guess we'll see. Because we'll see if anyone's still watching us blather on. <laughs> think, but, yeah, I think we have time for one more. I hope so because I just pulled it up. Are we blathering? We're not blathering. Yep. Nope. I'm going. All right. There is no happily ever after. Death guarantees it. To live is to die. The sun would not rise for me tomorrow. It would rise for everyone else, but not me. I was dying and could no longer deny it. Laying there, listening to the doctors and nurses scramble to give me 10 minutes, an hour, a day. I heard it in their voices and their fear was infectious. The weeping was fading away and I could no longer feel the hand holding mine. It is the thing. Can I just you say I like that right off the bat already? I feel yeah, like you... I've I've had this thought, you know, not I'm not like morbid or anything, but I've definitely had this thought like this will be me one day, and I bet a lot of people have had that thought that, you know, the sun will rise for everyone else, but it will rise for me. Like this I relate so much with this just opening. And I love the first line right off the bat. And I will so say happy. just reading it, it's reading like butter. I didn't stumble one time. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> it is the things you will never see or do again that you miss the most. To tell someone you love them one more time. To see something as simple as the sunrise. Such a mundane thing. A big rock moving around a burning ball of gas. Such a big thing to remind someone they are special. Death is the abyss we all step into. To live is to die. People prefer to ignore that fact. It keeps them sane and lets them smile. Only a fool would not fear it, but we must be fools to get through life. There was nobody to plead with, nobody to hate. The world was unfair, unkind, and brutal. People ignored that too, and did their best to try to make sense of it. That wasn't a fault. If there was a god, he kept his secrets well. The sounds faded, my eyes closed in fear, exhaustion, or prayer. Not even I knew, but the darkness behind my eyelids was losing substance, and it was too late to open my eyes for one last look at the world I was leaving. So many ways to die. 
Thoughts crowded my mind, fears, realizations, and more filled my mind as I slipped away forever. The doctor was swearing. I wouldn't have expected that of him. There were probably many old people that died under his care. Did he look at me, realizing that someday he would lay here on the edge of death, slipping into the unknown darkness? None of us know how we will face it until we do. Bravely, a song in our heart, weeping in fear, frantic, begging their God for more time, forgiveness, or some way to escape the inevitable. Everyone came this way. Everything faced this. It was like falling, but instead of wind against me, my memories fell away. Who and what I was faded and fragmented. I was becoming nothing. I need you, a voice whispered. Without a mouth, I couldn't answer. Without eyes, I couldn't see. A sanctus prelator to fight in places I cannot. <coughs> Who are you? I wanted to ask, but could only think. The voice gave my mind focus, delayed the dissolution of memories. I am not important, the voice said. I couldn't <coughs> tell if it was a man or a woman. Those hints were not available here in the fading darkness. How can I be your whatever if I know nothing about you? I thought. What are your thoughts? I've been I've been taking over first thoughts. <laughs> well, uh, one thought I had was earlier we talked about purple prose, and I thought we could kind of touch back on that. We said earlier that purple prose is when you're kind of sticking poetry in the middle of your story, and it's not necessarily helping the story. But what about this? This Ellen. this is great. This is really really good, and. Uh... The purple works here. It's it, well. It's it's not purple because it's working. You know, it's not. Oh, it's not brutally overdone. It's yes. It's kind of. It's appropriate. It's appropriate mm. to this particular situation. It works. Everybody was going to be a little bit, you know, kind of thinking profound thoughts. At, right at before this they point. die, in their way. Oh, yeah, I have no problem with this. This is really very good. This is, we're getting to know the character, their voice. We're getting to know their, you know, their worldview. We're really sinking into their soul in this last moment before death. Like I said, I find it really relatable. It, the writing is kind of poetic, but I, it, it's working for me really well here. And the couple little edits that you're making, it's just kind of sharpening the voice a little, a little more, taking out a couple words here, change, tweaking a couple words here and there that just make it, um, that tighten up the, the author's voice. So you're not making big changes. Yeah, we don't want to step on the author's voice. Mm. We don't, we don't. I so mean, so the, what's the difference then between purple prose where it's not helping the story and then- um, Purple prose poetic is, is if you walk around for no reason talking like, you think you're Byron writing a sonnet. Too much overdone description, too overblown, grandiose, um, too many adjectives sometimes is, is enough to do it. Um, just don't overdo it. Mm. That's the trick. Mm. Where is it overdone and where isn't it? But this, this is done quite well. Mm. I mean, uh, you, you just wouldn't walk through life going, such a mundane thing, a big rock moving around a burning ball of gas. I mean, you wouldn't say that in real life, but as you were lying there, dying you might actually think that you know yeah. take out all the words that you know and give it some more some more additional meaning right kayleen what do you think while you're reading it um i i actually i really enjoyed this um for like 98 percent, it was very smooth um for the most part i would say um for me there's just like there's just a couple little parts of repetition like to live is to die to live is to die it's said a couple times um but that's something that you go back and kind of scrub out where's where's the best place for the to live is to die to be to get the most impact out of it i okay. i don't know that i would scrub that i mean because the repetition i mean that's what you're going to keep coming back to in that situation i'm dying i'm dying i'm dying this i'm dying true. i'm dying, I'm, dying. Too. I'm actually dying hello i'm dying I accept now that I'm, I mean, that's where you would be in your head. Right. Is my opinion on that one. And then that little voice kind of reaches out. What is Hello. that? I want to know. What's that voice? What's going to happen next? Yeah. Is this the opening scene to the book? I wonder. I, I would be hooked. I would be reading. I'd want to turn the page. Um, so just because we, 
<laughs> the the name wasn't script or the the initials. I think I know who this is, and I have edited a lot of his work. I will say, dude face, you have come so excuse the explicitive fucking far. Go get yourself like a, an extra coffee shot and like I don't know a special candy or something because you've done you've you've come far and. I think this is the opening to to the book, so it's a very strong opening. I like it. Um, but yeah, just a little, ever... like some polishes, and again, um, like Ellen was saying, there. I mean, of course, we're going to have differing because we're different editors, man. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you did. You done did good. I like it. Good. Oh, nice one, Corey. Yeah, waxing noir. Definitely. Time, time for one more? Uh, sure, if you say so. We have All time right. for one more. Do we have people watching that want to continue watching us edit? says <laughs> no mas, so numero ocho. Ocho. My neighbor had a cat named Ocho. Oh, That's four, eight. right? Eight. And coincidentally, eight. eight. When I knew her, she had eight. At other times, she had more. Okay, let's see. All right, so we're going to do one more. And I already started, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Can you, oh, share your screen yeah. real quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, sure. All right, so I'm going to get to reading. Kitty glanced both ways lightly, careful not to draw attention to herself. So far, not one of her former associations really knew where she was staying at or even her new job as a laundress at the Whitman Hotel. To any whom she encountered believed, she was still a lady of the night at the saloon at the south end of Denver. She snorted. Never again would she do what she had to. Luckily, it didn't end her up in a predicament akin to Maisie, though she suspected it was a matter of time before it did happen. She got lucky in the sloppy, brainless men she took to her bed and those she stole from. Kitty scurried into Leonard's mercantile where rich folks like Audrey and some others would order special items out of large catalogs from back east. She had known some women who would save for years to get a specialty tea set, not her. Tea was like dirt and she wasn't desperate enough to drink it. Um, some of these sentences are very long. Um, yeah. And it, for I, I don't know, part, some of what's going on is getting kind of lost for me in a couple places here and there from what I've, I've already read. Um, I don't know. What are, what are your initial thoughts, Lauren? I want to hear more. All right. Yeah. The doorbell clanged, announcing her arrival. The old man, Leonard, sat on a rickety stool behind the counter. A young killed kid filled a crate full of goods for a man with a white collar around his neck. Kitty perked a brow, watching the man intently. His large, bulky frame appeared compressed in the attire of a reverend. His dark cedar brow hair was slicked back like a back alley gambler. She dipped to a different part of the store, listening and watching out of the corner of her eye. Kitty faked admiring bolts of, of cloth, all neatly displayed in standing racks. Her fingers wriggled, wondering about the opportune moment to strike. She wasn't above stealing, even with her job at the hotel, at any moment, she could be jobless. Events in her life had gotten away from her, forcing her hand more often than not. Nothing is good if nothing good is ever promised, she thought. Never lasts terribly long anyway. She eyed the man cautiously, slowly taking a turn about the mercantile. The man's eyes were like fresh spring grass, bright, emerald, and vibrant, even from the awkward angle she was at. A wide pink scar trailed the left side of his face from the corner of his eye, straight down to his jaw. Kitty feigned fingering cloth, flipping through the few bolts and acting like she was thoroughly interested. She had learned to trick several times. Men did not pay particular attention when it came to women, even more so when women were shopping. Oh, there's more. I'm shopping for a quick pick, she mused. The man rocked back on his heels heels, pulling out his purse from his left back pocket. Kitty rolled her eyes. Keep it in your chest pocket, goose. This is almost too easy. 
The man turned to her and smiled. Kitty smiled back, fawning her lashes. He quickly turned back around. She held in a snort. Okay, well, I I know this author too, and I know that this author has grown a lot. And one thing that this author has grown a lot in is she's figured out how to um, mix action and storytelling with reflection. She's kind of got a balance of all three Stop. going on. And that helps helps the reader to, to understand who Kitty is. And you start to feel like you know her because of those reflections. You start to pick up on her humor. And um, you start to pick up on this dynamic of the main character is kind of finding her mark, finding her target, and she's playing him. And that internal dialogue is going on too. So um, I like that. I agree with Lauren. This writer has grown a great deal. I'm I'm impressed with the with the level of growth since the last time I saw any of their work. I I might know who this is, but I don't because this one was fully scrubbed. Um, but I I do like what's what's being done. Um, the, that what you were saying, Lauren, the, the painting, the internal with this walkabout in um, the world building of where she is, where they are. It's kind of, it goes from one to the other to the next building on each other. Um, my only quip, I guess, is um, some of the sentences throughout, again, they just seem a little wordy. Um, and that's just like a little, a little bit of, of um, you know, polish in there to really get those parts to shine. And then going from, from one to the next, I think will come across a lot stronger. Yeah. 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 You can, you can pick it out from when Kayleen reads it out loud. There are a couple points where she stumbled and that's a sentence that would need just a little bit tweaking, maybe even um, deleting a phrase here or there, make it a little more concise, but that would be a sentence to kind of tweak and to smooth out the prose and, and to make the wording clear and concise. All right. Yeah. So we got through, how many did we end up doing? I don't know. Well, I'll have to go back and see how many we ended up doing. Cause I'm we, I'm, I'm quite happy with, with, with all of that. And if all of you live people watching or even people who are, are hearing it in the, uh, the, the podcast part, um, if y'all like it, maybe we can do another one, but definitely going to be on ask the editor where ellen can go through and give you that that quick shot like we did on your work you know i think probably once a week i don't know what she wants to do with that but it's a possibility ellen what do you want to do with that yeah well ask the editors coming back what i'm what i'm aiming to do is one a week and uh i will talk you through what i'm doing there you go you know I'll open the, I'm not going to bother to read it. I will just take you through it, through the edits. I'm not going to read it out loud because I don't read as well as Kayleen. So I'll just concede that now and go and go directly to the edits. But I'll tell you, I mean, kind of more of a stream of consciousness in my mind, what I'm thinking when I'm making changes. Hmm. And it's probably 15 minutes once a week, but it'll yeah. be a recorded show that we'll, we'll just drop them on Tuesdays. Right. It'll be something that other authors can look at and, and see hey, maybe this is something that I, I do too in my writing and I could change, or uh, this is something I can add to my writing. You, you can pick up tips from the Exactly, exactly. And, and don't forget, you can also submit your work. Yes. For another episode, for an upcoming episode. Oh, and Andrew Cole, this is great. For those submissions that you didn't get to, should we resubmit in the future? So anyone who did submit out of the 15 that were submitted that we didn't get to today, those are first up for Ask the Editor. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Um, and they will be they will be done as it were. Yeah. Um, and Tuesday in April. So, oh, sorry, Tuesday, April. There we go. So yeah. get, get a lookout for them starting in April. We'll on post, Tuesdays. Post um, and, and speaking of new shows coming or next shows coming up on March 19th, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have Jonathan Mayberry on to talk about writing characters readers love. I'm so excited. I love crafty topics. They just make my heart sing. So I can't wait to really dig into that because character really super drives your story. Because if you have characters people hate, well, I don't know. Unless they hate to love them. 
but that's We're a part of character building. Yeah. So I can't wait to get in it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody who uh, watched and everyone who submitted. Thank you so much for your submissions. I hope, you know, at least something we said helps you with your current work, with your future work. And be sure to check us out next week. Where we're going to talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Peace, guys. <laughs>